prevent your t- your opposition from scoring on you is considered a success. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the whole thing that you know a, a nil nil game, a zero zero game, whatever you want to call it, is considered a success. While here we would consider it uh, almost a failure, not a failure, but almost a failure. And it, partly it's because just the way you know we haven't had wars on our our country. Uh, but you know, Europe has, and other places have too. So it's just—I think it's embedded in the culture as well as um, you know other things too. Well, I had never thought of that in terms of defense versus offense. Although, as a as a terrible defender, I do see things through the eyes of uh, of somebody where the action is coming straight at you, and you want to, as I say, uh, stop the sneaky sobs be- before they get you. I do say that in the book. Uh, I hadn't thought of it in terms of, but I do mention that Americans of my generation, you know, bear in mind that part of what I was writing was tongue-in-cheek because the younger generations have discovered the sport. They've played it, if youth soccer really indeed does make fans out of people, and they've watched it. More important, they've watched it, they've followed it, they've realized how much fun it is, they've gone overseas. It's now part of the culture. It wasn't for the old uh, dinosaurs my age, the old sports writers my age. And I think that's more of what I'm referring to is the old mentality. Guys who would say, but, but nobody can like soccer because you can't use your hands. And I say, well, uh, Zidane could use his insteps better than some basketball players I know can use their hands or their minds. So I, 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 th- I thought it was a difference in generations also. That's a good point. That's yeah, a good point. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that a lot of – some. I think my, my brother's theory was actually good. I, it didn't make me cringe after he said it. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, the uh, other – and, and that's progress, by the yes, way. Yes, it is pro- you definitely. You guys are working this out. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is like a therapy session. Exactly. exactly. I'm here for you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit because I actually, I actually covered this, and, and I, this, this was one of my more favorite chapters in the book just because I had covered it, was the, the Women's World Cup in 1999. Right. Uh, and and I, I refer to that to a lot of friends of mine as one of the best times I ever had as a sports writer. And they look at me like I got three heads. And well, I, I just, I had such a good time covering because it. Because it was soccer it was, or because it was women? I think both. Um, it, it was, it was just, I, I enjoy, I don't know, I, I, it's hard for me to say why I enjoyed it so much, but it had to do, I think, probably with the players were so accessible and I think, I think in, in some way I almost felt appreciated because to that point there really wasn't much coverage for them. And then, then all of a sudden there was this, this enormous outpouring and, and mm-hmm. they, they kind of caught the, the, the nation and, and just became this big spectacle. And, and it, I mean, back before the term existed, they kind of went viral. Yeah. So, but I mean, what what do you tell us some some of your stories from from that World Cup and and you know I mean I I was very happy to see it included in the in the book I mean I you know just just obviously it's a World Cup but mm. you know I mean I just I just kind of thought that mm. you know maybe it would be just the men's World Cups but what what do you remember about that time and and tell tell us maybe one or two stories that uh, that are some of your favorites from back well, then. Well, thank you. I appreciate you noticing because it was important for me as I wrote it to include the women's World Cup. In fact, one of the chapters says something like, the title of it is, America Wins the World Cup. And that was 1999. You were, you were there. You covered some of those matches in, in New Jersey and elsewhere. And it was a great time. I don't know how the United States, you look back and you say at the founding fathers in the 18, late 18th century, how the United States managed to get so many far-sighted, intelligent people together in one place it was a miracle to have that many and i would say to have that many charismatic talented smart women female players in one place at one time probably a miracle probably hard to replicate ever again when you think about those people julie foudy michelle akers brianna scurry carla overbeck i mean go down 15 18 deep on that team character and talent. Mia Hamm, hardly even mentioned Mia Hamm, mm-hmm. Christine Lilly, that so many of them were, had a part in playing that, that you could go to anywhere, you didn't go in the locker room, but those women came out and talked to you outside, stayed a long time. No matter who you talked to, you were getting real insight into the sport. Julie Foudy was as good an interview as anybody I've ever talked to. Now she's down in, in Brazil with ESPN doing men's soccer, and that's a great breakthrough also. 
Yeah. The one, I'll tell you what, my, my favorite part of that World Cup, and I don't know if you were in the room, I'm assuming you were, but they packed us all in um, after a training session right before the, the final against China. Mm-hmm. Everybody, all of the media, they, they, they packed us into this, this little shack. I think I don't even remember where it was. But, um, and, and Julie Foudy said, everybody, please turn off your tape recorders. I don't, I don't want this recorded. I don't want this in any media. But they basically just thanked everybody who was in the room. Because they knew what kind of impact this was going to have on their lives. Like, all of a sudden, you know, like, after the first World Cup that the United States won, I, I remember the story. There was, like, five people at the airport when they got back. I mean, no, nobody really right. noticed. Right. And here was this, this thing all of a sudden where their life's work suddenly mattered to a lot of people. And, right. and they, were so, they were so appreciative of that and, and for all of the effort that we put in. And, and I mean, I, I don't know about you. Nobody's ever thanked me for anything <laughs> that I've yeah. written, except for high school kids well, or whatever. That's, but that's... that's that's a very good point. I mean, Foudy is smart, and she's also political. She understands that mm-hmm. she was building. They were building toward a league and other things going on. But it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime, a shot in the dark, to have Michelle Akers, who was the best player I ever saw, carried off the field like, like the great warrior she was, got whacked in the head, couldn't finish that final match against China, and, and they won anyway on some great plays late in, late in the game. But mm-hmm. the sequence of it, the playing as well as the personalities, and they were just so charismatic, it can't be, it can't be duplicated. No, I mean, it, it, was just, it was an organic thing that, that, like I said, it just took over the country and, right. and became this great event. Right. It, it's too bad the women, women's league didn't take off with those players. It, it really is. I remember when, when the league started, the WUSA, it was about a year later, and they played out in um, Roosevelt Field, at the, at the place right by... by right, yeah, Mitchell, right across the street, Mitchell Community. Field. Yeah. And I remember, I think it was Mother's Day, and the Washington team was playing the Long Island team. Mia Hamm came up with her team, and then you had um, Christy Pierce and Sarah Whalen and you know some of the players on Long Island. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be overflow. Every girl who plays on Long Island is going to grab her mother or vice versa. They're going to go to the game, and they didn't sell out. And yeah. I said... Maybe maybe women have more sense. Maybe they don't pay uh, to watch other people. Maybe they have other, better things to do. But it just didn't work out economically, which was a shame. Yeah, it was. Uh, ever since '94, uh, the United States is. Uh, even if you don't follow soccer, you you sort of know that the United States is involved with the World Cup. Right. Um, I thought the the '94 World Cup as a starting point was very good for the United States. You know, it was played all over the place in the country. Um, but how do you think they've taken it off from there as an organization, as a world organization, so to speak? Well, I think they've done fine. I think they're growing the sport. I mean, two things. You're talking about the Federation, and then you're talking about Major League Soccer. And I think both are doing fine. It's, it's nobody's fault that the United States hasn't produced the great genius that will lead them forward, because it's really not just the one genius. We haven't produced a Maradona or, uh, or a Socrates yet, but sure enough, there was a Landon Donovan and four or five of those Made in America players who created, and I, and I do a whole, that's the first chapter in my book, is talking about how Tim Howard, this guy who had played basketball in high school, pitches out from, a goal, from his keeper position, puts the ball on Landon Donovan's foot. They created this goal. The United States is doing very well with the players it has. These guys have gone overseas. They've taken the challenges. They're getting better. The United States just is not getting the best athletes in this country. If that ever happens, that would be a different story. But you've got to start early in soccer. You can't just take the entire starting defensive backfield for a junior college football team and say, okay, you guys go play soccer. I mean, it doesn't work that way because you've got to have the training for it from, from childhood. Do you, and you know, from having played it, right. you, don't, you, don't just, you don't just say go out there and out-jump somebody for the ball. You've got to know how to do it, what part of your head, uh, what position, what you can do, the fouls. You've got to learn as a kid. They do that in Brazil, they do that in the Argentina, and they do it here, but it hasn't reached critical mass yet where the U.S. is dominant, and maybe it never will, and maybe it never should. Do you, do you think that the, the fact that this, you know, there's the MLS and then there's the Federation, and there's, you, it, there are two separate things, and trying to play for both if you wanted to might be difficult, and also to follow it also where there's so many other sports in, in America. Do you think that's part of why maybe we never get a, a World Cup champion? It's just... 
too soon. Too soon? I, 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 the best and the brightest in places like Brazil, Argentina, Germany, Spain are playing, Italy, are playing the sport. They're learning the sport at a young age, identifying the players, and the players have all this memory. When you're eight years old in Italy, and somehow or other a Roberto Baggio or Franco Baresi is on the field with you, or guys you've never heard of who played the sport at a good level, and and they're teaching you things, you remember that. We have great teachers here. We have people, but it isn't as broad or as wide to draw people in. DeMarcus Beasley, who I I hope is going to start tonight at left back because I think he's their their best shot at that position. DeMarcus is a, a brother from Fort Wayne. He's five foot seven, five foot eight, and can dunk. I am told that he can leap up above and put the ball in. Could have been a small college, you know, Earl Boykins of Fort Wayne. <laughs> he had to go through all kinds of grief in his hometown where people would say, that's ah, a white man's sport. Why are you playing that? And DeMarcus and his brother loved the sport. They persevered and they played it. But they're in time. I mean, basketball and football, they're great sports. Why wouldn't people want to play those sports? But both of these guys want to play soccer, being relatively short, and they persevered and did it. But it's not that easy. No, and that, and that's something that a lot of people say in this country, like, like, oh, well, if LeBron James was a soccer player. Well, LeBron James wouldn't be an, an effective soccer player. His, his effective sport is basketball because, I mean, how many six foot eight, 260-pound soccer players are there? And maybe there will be. Yeah. You know, maybe, but I don't, you don't need to be that tall, no. although certainly it helps as a defender or for headers to be 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, My wife was watching the other night. We watched Italy come out, and she said, you know, a lot of those Italian players are – three and four and five inches taller than I remember them from watching years ago. And that's true. I mean, Franco Baresi, one of the great def- – my favorite defender of all time, Baresi, I stood next to him once, and I'm, I'm almost six feet tall. I was three inches taller than that guy. Wow. We're running out of time, George. We're talking with George Vesey, author of Eight World Cups, published by Times Books. We have about three more minutes. Um, what are you uh, – what are you uh, – George, where are you going to be watching the U.S. game tonight? Uh, actually, I'm going to watch at home. Uh, I made up my mind that I need to watch the U.S. games at home. I'm writing about it from my own website, georgevesey.com. I file every day. In fact, I already wrote a piece this morning about Didier Drogba, Drogba's great uh, cameo appearance the other night for Ivory Coast. But I will be watching tonight. I just want to get it. That. I find that if I'm watching in a crowd at a pub or something, you miss the details. You're, you're talking with people. You can't hear what's saying. So I want to watch the three U.S. matches uh, quietly. Spoils my plans. I was going to invite you out for a beer, George. Aren't, aren't you nice, man? <laughs> Thanks. No, I'm going to, I'm going to stay because I want to file right away. So I, I, in my own head, I'm working. I'm still writing about it. Because of the book, I want myself out there talking about this World Cup. I'm very current in it. And um, I, I will be very much involved in it right through the end of the tournament. And any pre- any, anybody's got any comments, would be glad to have them on georgevesey.com. Uh, any predictions uh, for the uh, remainder of the World Cup? You know, originally I thought that the politics, the stuff in the street, would hamper the Brazilian players. I still think it might. I think that the team that has, that, first of all, Spain has too many dog years on it. I've written about that on my website, and I picked Spain not to win uh, months ago just because they played too many great matches in recent years. The team that I think is strong enough mentally and ready to come in and win a World Cup in this generation is Germany. So that Germany was my pick before, and you know, barring barring madness today, even if they would get knocked off by Portugal uh, at noon today, I still think that Germany is strong enough to come in and win this World Cup. So that means we have to beat Portugal to get through the group. The U.S. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, well, you have to be have to be Ghana first. Well, I mean, yeah. That's three points tonight. Today is, is a must win. Is essential. Yes. And then you scrape by. You hope that other teams draw. I mean, the best thing for the United States would be to see. Uh, Germany and Portugal play off a, a tie today, and then the U.S. get its three points, you know, leading the, the division, which doesn't mean that much after one. But well, that might mean that you could get by with one draw against Portugal or Germany. Right. Well, George, we've, uh, we've run out of time. I want to thank you for joining us. We didn't even get to talk about uh, Jurgen Klinsmann or uh, Landon Donovan, or, Landon or, Donovan yeah. Yeah, or, or anything like that. We appreciate Klinsmann's, Klinsmann's a smart guy. He knows what yes. he's doing. He may be wrong, but he, 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 <laughs> he's, he's wrong about he's, Donovan. He's a force. Yes. He should have kept Donovan, I believe. I That's, think so, too. Yes. Uh, we're talking, we just Thanks, talked. guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, George. George. Great George. stuff. I appreciate it. Well. He's author of Eight World Cups, published by Times Books. 
And uh, Tim, we're out of here. We didn't even get a chance. An outstanding show. We, this is what happens when you have great guests. We were supposed.